So it turns out the book I reviewed last week isn't the only tense literary arctic scenario going on right now. So if you would indulge me, I would love to talk a little bit more about the World Cruise Atria Books partnership. Now, I have been off of TikTok for months at this point. I don't have an exact amount of months, but I haven't really been as active on the platform consuming because I'm trying to reclaim that reading time. And so I missed most of this. So I do think I saw the initial TikTok that kind of set this all off because if you've been around on the internet, you probably have heard about the world cruise that is going on. That is about my extent of the knowledge. I honestly became kind of bored with the whole thing pretty quickly in relation to the drama that was sure to percolate on the ship itself. But I recognize that I'm kind of a minority there because our story starts when the influencer Mark Sebastian basically put out a put me in coach TikTok and was basically fishing for partnerships to get on on to the world cruise to be able to kind of do ethnographic research in an influencer style about what exactly is going on. And so I imagined that a brand was going to pick up that opportunity pretty quickly just because of how much organic conversation and interest was fermenting around this and how it was just kind of an easy PR opportunity. What I never expected was for the brand that would ultimately sponsor him to be a Atria Books. This, of course, being one of the major imprints of one of the big five, Simon & Schuster. So we have a publishing house entering the chat, and I have a lot of thoughts about this. Now, to be clear, none of my thoughts are about the influencer specifically that is involved with this. I know nothing about him. I have not followed his journey in any way. Ultimately, he is just the vehicle for this discussion, and so I'm not really focused on that and don't have as much insight into that side of things as other people may. And because I haven't been on TikTok, I haven't seen any real-time reaction and commentary about this. So I apologize if this is completely played out, but I really wanted to discuss it. And I think there are some really interesting angles to discuss this from, so I want to jump into them. And the first of those angles being the presumed backlash. Now, while I haven't seen a whole lot of discussion around this, also the bookish side of the internet has been kind of distracted by scandals recently, I think that there are some expected kind of feelings or responses to this that I can anticipate having seen the way conversations have been trending generally, particularly around bookish influencers. Now, I recognize that I have a platform here and a community here that I am incredibly grateful for, and I am so happy you are here with me. But I also do not pretend that I am a bookish influencer. That being said, I have been around the bookish internet for a long time. I've been on Goodreads since 2007. I was reading blogs in 2017. 2013. While I did not get on the first wave of book YouTube, I am familiar with the conversations and I know we've been trending to some discontent lately in terms of recognizing the disparity in access for a lot of people within the community, as well as the fact that book reviewers and content creators are not compensated for their time by the industry, which is a whole can of worms that we will discuss to some depth. But because of that there are not a whole lot of opportunities, big opportunities for book influencers. And so this could be seen as lifting up someone outside of the community. And because there aren't like influencer trips, publisher sponsored brand trips that I have seen to the scale of something like you would have in the beauty community. Now granted, these are much different markets, but still. Now take all this with a huge grain of salt because again, I'm not an influencer. And so I don't know what the back end of a lot of these conversations looks like. If there are contracts, I know there's been some speculation lately or trending speculation about undisclosed sponsorships for reviews, which is never okay. And so I don't know what is the norm for the industry outside of what I can see. Now, that being said, we typically see things like receiving arcs more than payment for the labor of a review outside of like a trade publication you are reviewing for where you would get paid for that labor. Never enough, but still compensated for that thought. But in the grand ether of the book community, that is not an expectation. Now, do I think influencers should be paid for reviews? No, because I do think you need to have 
honest reviews. And there is that language in relation to reviewing ARCs that you have been given this free book in exchange for an honest review. And on top of that, there is not that guarantee that it is going to be a good review. And if you are sending unsolicited ARCs, there is not even a guarantee of a review. Because while ARCs have become kind of a currency and sometimes a status symbol within certain realms of bookish spaces, they hold no monetary value. They are not supposed to be resold. For any physical ARCs I still have in my possession, especially from my book selling days, anytime I am looking to kind of purge those, they either go into little free libraries or to classrooms if I can. And so we've got a community that's built on this passion for storytelling and reading and the community involved in that. And now we've gotten an influence from outside the community coming in and being gifted this huge opportunity when so many book influencers feel like they are ultimately being offered crumbs from publishers when they are essentially doing a lot of free marketing and publicity labor for them. And no, reposting someone's Instagram picture with barely a credit is not compensation. But at the same time, this campaign is clearly aimed at people who are not part of bookish spaces already. They are seeking out people who are not readers, new customers. And I can see why this would grate on the TikTok community especially, potentially, because again, I haven't been entrenched in these conversations and dialogues that may be going on. But BookTok has kind of taken on this badge of honor in terms of reintroducing a lot of people to a love of reading or introducing a lot of people to a love of reading for the first time. So I could see where this would smart a little bit. And you may be saying, if you're unfamiliar with the situation, well, Melody, how how does the publisher simply kind of funding this trip help get the word out about the publisher? Presumably other than them being mentioned in all of these articles that are circulating about this scenario. But they had this kind of poll where they had given him a bunch of books to be options for what he would read on this cruise. He's saying he's not a reader, but he's going to read a book on this cruise and we can talk about it. And so they've laid out a path for conversation around this book. Is it organic? No. Is it there? Yes. So then it becomes a question of do we trust a new reader's opinion on this book more than someone who is a more established reader? And again, I think everyone's opinions are valid and I think there's something really interesting and unique about having someone who is not traditionally a reader offer their thoughts and opinions on a book. Is the conversation going to be the same as someone who has a lot of experience as a reviewer? No but they could be looking for the reach to people who aren't traditionally buying books that comes along with it. And they undeniably are because that's why they sponsored this opportunity. And so with that, let's move into the book that was ultimately selected to be discussed on this brand trip. And I think the most interesting article about this that I have come across is Out of Publishers Weekly by Sophia Stewart. And I will of course link it down below and I will be pulling information from this article, which I will reference directly. But it is, why did Atria Books send a TikTok influencer on a cruise to Antarctica? And so the book that was ultimately selected in this poll was The Last One by Will Dean. And I'm gonna go ahead and read the blurb from Goodreads to you now, just so we're all on the same page. But it says, when Kaz steps on board the exclusive cruise liner RMS Atlantica. It's the start of a vacation of a lifetime with her new love, Pete. On their first night, they explore the ship, eat, dance, make friends. But when Kaz wakes the next morning, Pete is missing. And when she walks out into the corridor, all the cabin doors are open. To her horror, she soon realizes that the ship is completely empty. No passengers, no crew, nobody but her. The Atlantica is steaming into the mid-Atlantic, and Kaz is the only person on board. But that's just the beginning of the terrifying journey she finds herself trapped on in this white-knuckled mystery. So in the sense that it is a mystery, it's appealing to a broad audience. I think thrillers and mysteries bring in a lot of new readers, but we notice, surely, that we are on a ship here. And so this Publishers Weekly article specifically cites a newsletter from Kathleen Schmidt in speculation that this was a little bit more rigged than it looks like, that it wasn't necessarily an organic process because we have something that is so thematically linked to the idea of this cruise. And I would be inclined to lead that way myself, even if it is not as overt as rigging the vote. We clearly have a book that is thematically linked 
to this cruise. So I would assume that people would trend in the direction of choosing that book because it's already on their mind. It's already part of the conversation. Schmidt also speculates that this could be rigged because this is one of the only books that was presented as a selection that hadn't received a substantial marketing push around publication or already. Now, Publishers Weekly says this book was published in 2020. Everything I saw on Goodreads showed it being published in August of 2023, and Edelweiss was showing the paperback as an August 2023 release and showing it as backlist. Now, I could not trace if this was an original paperback release or this was just citing the paperback as coming out in 2023. Usually Goodreads, we can track the publication of hardcover versus paperback formats and have that historical data. So the kind of look at this shifts slightly depending on when this was published published as well, because if it was published in 2020, we have this idea of a major investment in a book that is now, well, it's still three years old if it was August, but still three to four years old versus something that was published in August. So that is a consideration as well. But in terms of the thematic links, would this campaign even have been presented if there wasn't that connection? My dramaturgical brain says no. Now, granted, I don't have a marketing brain by training, but I imagine this would be a goldmine. So if that's the case, does this essentially boil down to a $7,000 approximately, according to the Publishers Weekly article, investment in the marketing of this book with some backlist fan favorites and some more diverse options thrown into the mix. Though to be fair, backlist fan favorites are more likely to reach a broader audience or appeal to a broader audience. And then if we're approaching new readers, we're presenting kind of tried and true titles that they probably haven't come across organically anyway. I can look at something like Frederick Bachman's Anxious People and be like, oh yeah, that's old news. But that is not going to be everyone's experience. I think that we forget how slow moving the kind of word of mouth is in terms of people just coming across books in their daily lives outside of the internet. And I think publishers forget about that too often as well. So if this is essentially a 7K marketing push, it makes me wonder what the marketing budget for most books is. Because to my kind of cursory glance at this book, especially based on the number of ratings and the star rating on Goodreads right now, which again, we're not putting a whole lot of stock into it seems like it's a mid-list title, which is neither here nor there, but what is the kind of norm marketing budget for a mid-list title, for a lead title? Because I think we have a lot of conversations right now about authors not getting the marketing backing they should from their publishers. So I'm not mad that a book is actually getting a marketing push. It just makes me very curious about whether this is a normal investment. Also, like, what does a book tour usually cost? I don't know. It also makes me question how this aligns with a normal marketing assistant, marketing associate salary, which I know they're very different pools, but I am very conscious right now of how understaffed a lot of these teams are and how they're being asked to do a lot with a little. And I will also admit this book was not previously on my radar. I had to look it up for this discussion, though I haven't been as big on thrillers and mysteries of this bend lately. However, in reading some of the existing reviews, it does seem to have a speculative angle or a sci-fi angle that makes me go, hmm, it makes me a little bit more interested. And that angle, especially if this is being marketed to thriller readers, could be contributing to the lower Goodreads score as well. But it also makes me question whether something with a more speculative bend is the easiest buy-in for people who are traditionally not readers. And I don't want to sound judgy here. Everyone has their book. Everyone has their thing that gets them in. And this could be the kind of spark that ignites a lot of new readers because they didn't even realize this was an option. But again, historically, to my kind of view, and granted, this is being kind of framed by the fact that I was a bookseller during the height of the Girl on the Train era. But that brought in a lot of new readers and revitalized a lot of new readers through that genre. And it was very accessible for people, people who just wanted a quick read, something they could read at the beach, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know if adding that speculative angle on top is weeding out some of the potential audience. Now, granted, I love a speculative angle, so I am not saying that that is bad, but it's just a consideration I have. So if you have thoughts on that, let me know. So, okay, where does all of this leave us? What I found particularly interesting about the framing of the Publishers Weekly article 
is that it was analyzing whether this has been a successful campaign based on book scan numbers. So have we sold more books? I think it's also worth noting that Stewart specifically mentions that Atria already had five of the 35 bestsellers for 2023. Now, I believe three of those were Colleen Hoover titles, which brings us back to the idea of book talk in some ways. Now, Colleen Hoover has become kind of inextricably linked with book talk, but when I was a bookseller, I did remember seeing her books on displays quite frequently. I have personally never read a Colleen Hoover book in my life. That's not saying anything about her one way or the other, just kind of a statement of fact. And I also really have no intentions of doing so. But that's just kind of the baseline we are at in terms of where Atria is kind of centered in the market in some ways, which I think is pretty notable because at least for me, when I think of the big five, Simon & Schuster doesn't always kind of fall high on the list for me when you're putting it up against something like Penguin Random House. Now granted, they're all consolidated so much at this point, it's really past meaning, but there we are. So looking at these numbers, and apparently the TikTok live discussion about this book hosted by the influencer was on January 11th. And in the week of January 6th, they sold 54 more copies of this book than the week before. Anecdotally, I could easily sell between three to four copies, depending on how many they could get us from the warehouse of books like The Girls of Murder City and Sin in the Second City at the cash register when I was a bookseller. Now, that is relevant because it is also kind of thematically linked. I was a bookseller in Chicago. I was in an area where we saw a little bit more tourist traffic. So there was that interest. Also, they were kind of scandalous, titillating history. I knew my audience and I knew what I was interested in. And you might be like, Melody, three to four is not 54. However, that adds up rather quickly. And so if you think about all of the booksellers across the country that are hand selling their favorites, that are talking up their favorites, it feels like there should be a more notable bump from something that is such a big campaign than 54. But we do also have to take into account the fact that we are specifically targeting non-readers, so I don't know what the expected conversion was there, or if it was simply being able to get the publisher's name out more, getting these books in front of more people. Though I think it is important to note that all of the other books that were up for selection for this process saw a decrease of sales for the same week. Still, I do like to see innovation and creative thought from publishers. Though publishers, if you're watching, I've done a whole video before about some of the innovations readers would love to see. Would love to see you jump on some of those. However, there are also things I think would have pushed this even further. I couldn't find any evidence that they tried to do a book club on the ship. And to my knowledge, this influencer has linked up with some of the other influencers, kind of main characters on the ship. Again, I'm not really plugged into that world. I don't really need to be or want to be for this discussion. We're kind of just discussing the ideas, right? So I think like a book club on the ship would have been an interesting angle to approach this and then invite other readers into that. That would have been a bigger conversation potentially, but that may have just been too many logistics for this kind of last minute effort. Again, it's also worth noting that on all of these articles that are coming out about this influencer on the ship, I've seen one from the Washington Post, I've seen one from the New York Times. Again, in these articles, they are name dropping Atria Books, Simon & Schuster, what have you. So there is more brand awareness that is associated with this in addition to the specific books and specific title that is associated with this. Now I could argue how much brand awareness is needed around a specific publisher. I don't know. Like I think you lead with the books and that's what people are interested in. They're not thinking about what specific imprint publishes those books, at least from a more general consumer standpoint. But that being said, they might be more likely to Google the publisher after seeing them listed. So I don't know. I don't know the kind of conversion associated with that. It's then also worth considering, again, though I don't know anything about what may be going on with this influencer on the ship, is the publisher then associated with any behavior or antics that that influencer gets up to on the ship. It's worth noting and considering in the kind of cost of benefit analysis of the situation. And I clearly, they fell on the benefit side, but I don't know, how is that piece gonna play out? Also, am I playing into the calculated PR machine of this by talking about it right now? 
Probably, but it does also make me consider what are some of the campaigns that may have been going on flying under the radar. There's a lot of considerations, there's a lot of food for thought, and I would love to hear yours. Regarding anything we've talked about, what you think about the influencer side of this in relation to influencers outside and inside of the book community, what you think about this as a marketing move for this specific title, whether you think it was a more directed, calculated move on behalf of this specific title, or if you think it was a more genuine and crowdsource kind of thing, whether you think it was ultimately successful, and what does success look like from something like this? Do you think we can anticipate more moves like this? And if we do start seeing more moves like this, what do you think that's going to mean for the temperature of the bookish community? So I don't know, I just found this all very interesting without wanting to kind of dive into the drama of the ship itself. I think that there is a lot of really interesting food for thought here. So again, let me know what your thoughts are, but as always, thank you for hanging out and listening to mine. If you've enjoyed this conversation, go ahead and like and subscribe. Would love to have you hang out more, but most importantly, read something good, and yeah, bye.